first. One of the things is, I always wonder about crowd dynamics. If you guys want to get closer, you're certainly welcome to. Wow, that really worked. That's amazing. Okay. I didn't know I had that much power over crowds, but that's great. So there will be some cameras in front of you. We really appreciate that we're getting coverage on this today. In case you didn't know, this is actually part of a national event. So rallies have already started in the eastern part of Canada and some of those will already have been concluded. And uh, we're kind of on the west side, we're the last for the country to get started. And there are rallies in Abbotsford and in Salmon Arm in BC. So I think BC is actually quite a leader in this event as far as number of rallies in Canada. So I think that says a lot about how we feel about science on the west coast. I'd like to get started uh, by introducing our first speaker, who is Joe Foy. He's probably quite familiar to a number of you in regards to his work with the Wilderness Committee. He's the National Campaign Director for the Wilderness Committee. And uh, interestingly enough, anecdotally, he was the first paid campaigner the Wilderness Committee had back in 1987. Joe. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep my little talk uh, real short. I am not a scientist. What I am is I'm just a person who was born and raised in this part of the world, love this place where we live, care about it deeply, and I understand that the truth matters. It matters how things work. decisions mean a good life and bad decisions mean a life trying to fix your mistakes and that's why science matters. Now, I've worked with the Wilderness Committee for a long time. We've worked uh, with so many, so many of you, so many of other organizations, First Nations communities to get protected areas, to get proper environmental laws. And why I'm happy to be here to speak today is I've noticed a constant and steady erosion of having science speak to us when we're trying to make our decisions. And that's a big, big problem. And I'll talk to you just a couple of examples. You know, there's a mine up in uh, the Chilcotins they wanted to build at a place called Fish Lake. And it was turned down because of big impacts on grizzly bears. And yet I've watched, to my horror, that that mine project has come back. As far as I can see, it's going to have the same impacts on those South Chilcotin grizzly bears. And that's why science matters. It matters that our biologists have a chance to speak and tell us about what's going on. More and more at the Wilderness Committee, you're going to hear from people today who are scientists. More and more at the Wilderness Committee, we have to rely on legislation called Freedom of Information legislation. So information that all our tax money paid for, whether it be in the training of scientists at our universities, in the gathering of that information, we paid for that. We should be able to get access to it. And more and more, we have to rely on legislation to try and pry that out. A lot of the information is blacked out. They charge money to the people who want to try and get it. And it takes a long time. Sometimes it takes as much as a year to get critical information on critical decisions. We saw that happen 
on the run of river uh, uh, private hire hydro projects where it took us a long, long time to find out that fish were being killed downstream of these things. Lately, we've all got a, a, a very big thing to face, and that's, you've probably heard about the disappearing bees, the disappearing pollinators. Well, it turns out for almost 10 years now, Canada and other jurisdictions have been using a class of pesticides called neonicotinoids. And they have been brutal on our pollinators. And that's a big, big deal. And we need our signs in issues like this, in issues like the pipeline issues, and so many, many issues. So thanks for coming out today. This is going on all across the country. I'm very grateful to the organizers for doing this here and in the other towns. Let's get this turned around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. You always rock the house. Now, I'm very honored to introduce our next guest. Um, Again, he's probably someone who doesn't need too much introduction from me, a very minor one. So I'd like to introduce Dr. David Suzuki. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today, but I'm afraid, being an old professor, I'm going to give you a serious lecture today. If you were to assess what society's priorities are by the amount of space devoted to them in newspapers or television news reports, I think you'd very quickly realize that Canadians are obsessed with politics, business, sports, and celebrity. And yet none of these is nearly as important in terms of determining the way that we live than science. Science when applied by industry, medicine, and the military. I was born in 1936 when I was a boy. My mom and dad didn't worry that I was watching too much television because there was no television when I was a boy. They wouldn't let me go to movies and, or sw public swimming pools in the summer because they were afraid I would catch polio. When I was a boy, hundreds of thousands of people died every year of smallpox. These are things that smallpox and polio are things our kids today have no idea what they are. When I was a boy, there were no transcontinental phone calls, there were no satellites, there were no uh, uh, birth control pills, I could go on and on and on, certainly no cell phones or text messaging. The world has changed enormously as a result of the application of science and technology. Science provides the fundamental insights that we need that may lead to the application of those ideas, but far more important, I believe, Science provides us with a description of the way the world works. Scientists are always making new discoveries. Why? Because we know so little. We look out and we try to discover more about how the world works. Science, not politics or corporations, provide by far the best assessment of the way the world works and uh, the information that we need to decide how we must act. As you know, we now have a Prime Minister intent on pushing, on pushing through the, the pipeline across British Columbia. Before all of the scientific information, the assessment is even in. We don't make informed decisions that way. We have to assess the information available. But what we are now is we're threatened with politicians deciding not only whether or not to listen to uh, scientists, but the kind of information that scientists are allowed uh, to tell us about. When we shut down research, such as the Experimental Lakes area, and I have to tell you as a scientist, this is the most baffling thing for the government to do. It makes absolutely no sense. Canada has such a small place in the global scientific community anyway. Why on earth? would we shut down one of the gems of science in this country? It makes no sense. But when we shut that down, or when we shut down the polar expeditions to discover the effect of climate change, then politicians have nothing to counter the decisions that they make. So it may make political sense, it doesn't make any other kind of, of sense. 
The great strength of science is its openness to scrutiny, to examination, and self-correction in the end. You know that some of the leading climatologists 40 years ago, looking at the evidence at that time, thought maybe we were headed for a climate cooling episode. But then when the data became more, more uh, became stronger and our, our theories were much more sophisticated, it became clear, no, we were not going into a cooling, we were going into a period of global warming. But of course, that's always raised as, see those scientists? They used to say it was cooling, now they say it's heating. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. It's got no relevance. That's the very nature of science itself, the process. And we should understand that as we begin to assess scientific input. But I think that our government is acting as if out of sight, out of mind. No, they don't want to hear anything that will counter the kind of political or economic agendas that they have. How can we make an informed decision on the future of the Northern Gateway Pipeline and the consequences of an oil, a major oil spill if we don't have the best scientific evidence that we have today? How can we make a, a decision about the impact of climate change on permafrost and the release of giant clathrates of methane in the Arctic? How can we make an informed decision as we look at vanishing caribou, at polar bears, or at grizzlies? How do we examine the effect of uh, pollination or the future of pollination if we don't know the science behind the effect of pesticides on pollinators? How would we, will we judge the hazards or the benefits of GMOs without science? How can we talk about the future of the acidification of oceans without science? It seems to me, and I could list dozens of issues like this that impinge on our daily lives. We need more science. We, we face an increasingly difficult and uncertain future because scientists and uh, populations have suddenly increased and changed in our relationship with the Earth. There has never been one billion mammals of any species on the planet until we reached a billion people around 1803. We now have seven billion, this is unprecedented. We have a gigantic ecological footprint, but we now have amplified that with technology. Technology that enables us to attack any part of the planet in a search for raw materials and to spread our wastes and toxic material all over the planet. And of course, you and I have become unbelievable consumers and everything that we consume comes out of the earth and there's an ecological impact of that. And we've now bought into a global economy that does what? Provides us with this profusion of products in which the ecological and social consequences of those products are no longer visible. When you buy a Toyota car, do you ever ask, where did all the metals come from that make up this car? What was the impact on the people that were mining? The people that lived in those? We don't ask those questions. When we buy a cotton shirt, you know, we may want the brand on the shirt, but do you ever ask, where was this cotton grown? Is it organic? Cotton is one of the most chemically intensive crops that we, we grow. And if you look at the consequences of growing cotton on a massive scale, it's been an ecological and social disaster. But globalization hides all of that. We just go into a store, I want a product, lay my money down, and we get it back. And we no longer see what scientists could tell us about the impact. We. Uh, Collectively, human beings have become an unprecedented force on the planet itself. We are now altering the chemistry, the physics, and the biology of the biosphere on a geological scale. That's why scientists refer to this as the Anthropocene Epoch, the era in which humans have become a geological force. And in the process, with this power, we are undermining the very things that keep us alive and healthy. And that is the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food that comes from the soil, the energy that comes from photosynthesis and biodiversity. Those are the fundamental things that we need to stay alive and healthy. In an increasingly uncertain future, the best
best thing we have to guide us into that future is facts. Facts and the best information we get comes from science. We have now seen what this government is all about. It canceled the long form census. Why? Because people should have the freedom to choose what they do or do not do. do. Freedom comes with responsibility. And part of that is taking part in these censuses that will provide government and society with an input on where we are at this point and how we can guide ourselves into the future. We have a government that opposes safe injection sites in spite of the knowledge that it saves lives. We have a government that has canceled the long gun registry despite law enforcement officers across the country saying that it works if you have the registration. We have a government, the Harper government, that has um, that wants to expand the prison system in spite of the fact that crime rates are dropping. Now, I'm not a guy that tends to think that uh, there are all these uh, obscure uh, things that are going on we don't know about, but quite frankly, are we expanding the prison system because the Harper government intends to create new uh, areas of criminality? How about eco-terrorists? How about radical extremists? Is that what's going to fill our jails in the coming years? Okay, I, sorry, I've gone on too long. If we 